there are two kinds of people some people are wise and some are otherwise <laughs> and <laughs> and it is not just that it is some people there are not just two categories it is rather we slide from one category to another at different times it's 7 o'clock thank you <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes we surprise ourselves by doing something clever and sometimes we shock ourselves by doing something stupid so at one level it's uh, it's to some extent a mystery what is going on inside us i remember when i was in college i was studying engineering and i was a th third year of electronics engineering and we were doing a experiment in a lab so at that time suddenly one of my friends told me hey there's wildlife on your shirt i looked around and even before i saw my first thought was don't kill it and then there was some kind of insect or ant on my shirt and i just gently put my finger there it crawled on my hand and then i put it down and then just a couple of days later with the same friend he had done something which had made me so angry i just we were at some distance maybe at the he was where you are those of you are at the end uh, he was at that distance and i got so angry i said i started charging towards him with a fist i said i'll kill you and then i was just rushing towards him suddenly it is like there are some moments in my life when i have observed myself from above my body not a literal out of body experience but a conceptual out of body experience when i see myself from above hey what's what's going on what is this what is this guy doing over here then it's then somehow because of the same person and i was looking at his face from here and i was also looking sort of looking at myself from above so at that time he had a when i had taken that small insect and put it on the ground it was he had a bemused expression on his face and now also he had he was shocked at the intensity of the ferocity of my anger and it struck me hey wait a minute the same person who the other day was not even wanting to hurt an ant is now saying i'll kill you so who is this person is that the real person or is the real is this the real person so that from that time itself or those two incidents were particularly memorable for me as making me think what goes on inside us what exactly happens and they made me think uh, or rather explore to try to understand what happens inside us and uh, there was also another trend going on in my life i always had a lot of faith in the power of education my grandfather had been a teacher and i had faith that by getting good education we could create a better life for ourselves and we can help others create a better life for them so when i was studying in college at that time i also joined a social welfare organization and in that social welfare organization uh, i took up the education part in it i became a not a took up i became a member in that and we would go to some nearby slums is the word slum common over here okay slums are more like ghettos flip Get ghettos where people how is it pronounced ghettos ghettos okay ghettos okay no i have last <laughs> sorry What do you say? We have we have some places in Britain that remind us of like ghettos. Like ghettos, okay. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so last few months I have been discovering how poor my English pronunciation is, because there are some words we pronounce in a particular way in India, and everybody pronounces like that. So it's like a uh, consensus reality illusion. So anyway, it's ghetto, not ghetto. 
okay so <laughs> so i just silent over there so anyway so it was, so i used to go to the ghettos and i used to uh, conduct some free tuitions for the kids over there so i was i was teaching english history maths or whatever they needed and we became a little friends and i soon came to know that they were from dysfunctional families of course now what that this was people were 25 years ago so the families were together now dysfunctional families probably means the family themselves are disintegrated but they were together but still their fathers were alcoholics and there was domestic violence and as i started hearing their stories i started thinking that what i am sharing how much of a difference is going to make in their lives okay uh, they live in fear sometimes when their uh, fathers come home at that time i remember i had read a communist uh, cartoon which said that um, in what is the russian wine called vodka 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 okay so indian pronunciation is vodka 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 okay so the russia so so the so the the cartoon was the vodka price vodka okay vodka the price had gone up so there is a child a son who is asking his father little apprehensively so father the vodka price has gone up so will you drink less now and the father looks at his son and says no you will eat less <laughs> so you will eat less so it so now that was of course very jolting but i realized the situation in the houses of these kids was not much different and then we decided to diversify into helping people free themselves from alcohol alcoholism so we got some campaigners who would speak we got some counselors and we ourselves got some training and gave some talks and gradually a good number of people gave up i at least one it was one of our, my friends was used to go to a small village where he was able to you could say make the whole village dry or sober mm. and that was considered a big victory for us but after a few weeks this friend came to okay i used to go to the nearby ghetto and this friend would come back from those that would go to the village and when he came back he was looking shattered and i asked him what happened so there had been a local corporate corporate elections over there local municipal local elections for the local government and one of the candidates in order to woo the uh, people to vote for him had brought several truck loads of free liquor for everyone and not only the fathers but even their children had drunk and that was the time we were very disappointed but we also started thinking what is it that that makes people do such things it is that at one level you could say that through education you open new doors for people to walk through but it seems something inside them stops them from uh, walking through those new doors and it's not just something inside them as i remember correlated with what i trying to attack this friend that that something is there inside us also mm. so what is it inside us that works against us and so it was questions like this that i was exploring i read I read quite a few self help books and then gradually i uh, i was introduced to the bhagavad gita and initially i was not very interested in the bhagavad gita because my conception was this is a hindu religious book and i was not into religion but one of my friends who had been far more materialistic than me he recommended it to me so then i said okay i i read it because of that he had been more materialistic and he had become more spiritual than me so i thought what happened over here so then i started reading that book and then i came to the third chapter and 36th verse it spoke to me it is almost as if arjun was raising the same question which i had so 336 says athakena prayukto yam papam charati purusha 
अनिच्छन भी वार्षने या बलादिवनी योजिता by what is one impelled to act self destructively now when i read this this is what i have been searching by what impels us to act against ourselves so it it doesn't take much time for us to recognize that we are not the masters of our own house that if we consider the body to be our own house we are not the masters here yes of course sometimes we are able to do what we want to do but sometimes we are not able to one of my friends was joking with me he said that currently i am on a seafood diet i said what do you mean i said whatever food i see i eat it that's <laughs> <laughs> a seafood diet <laughs> so we tend to be impulsive like that the impulses come upon us and then they consume us we get carried away by them so there could be desire which distracts us there can also be we all have various kinds of fears that overwhelm us it could be worry it could be stress it could be anxiety mm. I didn't know only recently. Actually, I was at a conference in America on spirituality and medicine, or spirituality and health rather. So I came to know that there's a widespread phobia of spiders. Do you know what it is called? Arachnophobia. Arachnophobia. Okay, arachnophobia. Thank you. So. <laughs> 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 no, it's real. It's real. I, I just, I know that's real. <laughs> I didn't make it up. <laughs> so then I used to think that those who have arachnophobia, they feel fear when they see a spider. And I realize that's not actually true. They feel some fear when they see a spider, but they feel real fear when they stop seeing the spider. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean hey it was there where did it go is it going to come on me now <laughs> so <laughs> so again where do these fears come from say one person sees the spider they don't feel much fear others see the spider they feel fear so the bhagavad gita describes that so when i read this the question struck me what makes us do wrong things but the bhagavad gita's answer took a long time for me to understand in fact i read it several times and i talk with uh, some of those who were trying to teach me gita and i contemplated it it took me a long time to understand so now the way i understand it the best is that through a computer metaphor just like i have a computer here now computer has a hardware a software and a user so you could say the body is like the hardware the mind is the software and we the consciousness are like the user mm so our fears as well as our addictive desires like these people are addicted to alcohol or say i had anger issues i was getting angry with someone so those all these are like corruption in the software they are like viruses coming in the software and it struck me that when these viruses come up one of my friends uh this was much later but i'm putting it all together now so one of my friends told me that his brother was a alcoholic and he was he was very determined to break free from alcoholism but somehow he kept relapsing and then he was from a very wealthy family so what happens is generally if you go to a bar and you don't have any money then they won't give you if you don't have a credit card they won't give you but he was from such a big family that even if he didn't have anything they would pay because you know that the father or the brother will come and pay later so they then <laughs> so then finally they actually send a alert to all the bars in their nearby vicinity saying that this person has is trying to recover from alcohol so if he ever comes to your place please don't give him alcohol and then he uh so one day he called his, his brother called this this boy now his brother became a devotee later but now he's telling me early incident his brother called him and he said oh my car is not uh, my car is not moving i need somebody to tow me so then 
they both worked and they got somebody to tow the car and he came back and then that night because they, so he was helping their joint family so he was help him to uh, if he had some any needs so he suddenly heard his brother was staying in the next room he suddenly the door opening and his brother going out somewhere and then he got up and he started follow him and his brother went straight here a flashlight was night he went to the car which had been towed that night and then he said what is he doing is he going to drive somewhere now they didn't want him to drive at night so they would keep the car key also away from him but he went somehow out of the car gas tank and then he opened the gas tank and then he had like a straw which you use for maybe drinking coconut water and he put the straw inside the gas tank and he was drinking from there i said what are you doing and then what they found at he had gone to some distant place and where they had not didn't have the alert the alcohol bars don't give him alcohol so he had drained the whole gas tank and filled it with alcohol and now at night he was drinking from there <laughs> <laughs> so, so the point i'm making is that here uh, it he said that at this point till this point i used to be angry with him he said you know no you can't see how much your parents your you had a wife you had a child can't you see how much trouble you are putting all of them under why do you keep drinking why are you so weak willed but he said when i saw him doing this it suddenly struck me that he, he is not uh, degraded or demented he is tormented it's not that he is morally weak or he is mad it is just that the desire must be tormenting him so much do this do this do this not to think about this whole plan to actually drain the gas tank and it's dangerous to put alcohol in the gas tank and concealing it over there and then it's it's it requires a sh- enormous amount of planning and it's not that he is a fool he's an intelligent person to be able to do it so it struck him that actually so, there is something within us torments us do this do this do this do this do this and then we just don't know how to resist it so basically for all of us we have this mind and the mind when it gets programmed with negativities with some negative cravings with negative fears with negative drives with anger when these drives start rising they just start hitting us and hurting us from within and at that time it's like say if somebody is beating us from outside at least we can try to defend ourselves in some way we put on a armor maybe try to run away from there but if something is tormenting us from within where do we go what do we do and it's that all of us we are led down this path without even realizing what is happening the most of us may not have any kind of any addict to desire of that extreme but still the point remains that this software once it gets corrupted it is quite difficult to correct it can be corrected it can be it can be avoided but it's not that easy so anyway understanding this three level nature of reality helped me to make a lot of sense of my own behavior as well as the behavior of people around me so for me the main practicality of the bhagavad gita was not so much i was never although i was born in a brahmin family i was never really into any kind of rituals but i once through in my teenage years maybe 9th 10th standard i went through a phase of uh, aggressive atheism but then afterward i just felt that uh, i didn't have enough faith to be an atheist <laughs> <laughs> that means that i just didn't have enough logical reasons to prove the non existence of god i couldn't very well prove the existence of god but i definitely couldn't i couldn't prove the non existence of god 
So then I just decided that there is no need to be such an aggressive atheist and then I started wading somehow for whatever reason towards at least being open to the idea that there might be something higher. Well, and then gradually I encountered the Bhagavad Gita. But for me, the Bhagavad Gita's eminent practicality is in terms of its capacity for inner empowerment and inner transformation. So I'll talk two main points and then maybe we can, you can give me, share some thoughts. Um, but before that, have you had any experiences of any of your friends uh, or any people in your social circle getting into any kind of addiction? Somebody who is close to you? Yeah? Yeah. 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 Okay. Any, would any of you like to share that, that experience? Not in, no need to mention names, but maybe what some specific, see addiction is a general thing. You might see somebody doing something, but some somebody did something which shocked you or which alarmed you or which alerted you. Somebody did something which is very uncharacteristic. Basically what I'm saying is that you know, there is something inside us which works against us and which can make us do things which we wouldn't want to do, would normally not do. So have you seen something like that among your friends? Yeah. I think that everyone's addicted to their friends, including myself. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody's addicted to phones. Yeah, yeah. yeah actually I was in Colorado, uh, Colorado State in America, in Denver University. So I gave a talk there on, do you need to break up with your phone? <laughs> do you need to break up with your phone? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think that, uh, mm, okay, I appreciate just a couple of observations about this. See, the word addiction has a technical meaning and has a general meaning. Just like there are many words, say for example, if a, if a scientist is doing some research in the lab and a scientist tells their assistants, you know, we are running out of energy. That probably means maybe their battery is getting discharged or some other, they refer to energy in an electrical sense. And if say, they, that same scientist comes back home and the kids want to play with them and they say, no, I have no energy. Mm. Now here the word energy is being used in what sense? In the sense of physical energy. So it's a more general sense. So I think the word addiction is nowadays used as a, as a, in a general sense, to refer to any kind of behavior that uh, becomes uh, uh, that becomes compulsive, that we keep uh, that becomes irresistible, that we keep doing a lot. Um, you can use it for that. You can use have TV addiction. You can have phone addiction. You can have internet addiction. But I would like to focus a little bit more on some kind of addiction that has serious destructive effects. I would say that, okay, you can stretch and say continuous phone addiction also has not destructive, but at least it has a distracting effect. Mm -hmm. And you could accumulate it and it could, you could say it's a destructive effect. But uh, anything which you saw, somebody having a, like a seriously destructive kind of either destructive effect or a destructive direction, somebody was going. Is the difference, the difference I made is clear, what I said? Okay. So when all of you said you have seen somebody addicted, were you all talking about something like phone? No. <laughs> 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 mm. Yeah, please. Can you give a specific experience or something? Not, I mean, no, no, sorry, no, see, see what, what I don't, what I don't want is that, just you know, okay, you can say taking drugs is a, is a, can be addictive. Taking smoking can be addictive. Alcoholism, but something which you saw, which or you saw somebody doing it, or something which you experienced around you, which made you think, hey, this is, this is going in a dangerous direction. This is, see, yeah, you would like to share something like that, more specific. By the way, what is your name? Who is going to speak? Can you please tell your name and then you can speak? Lakshmi. Lakshmi, yeah. Um, well, one of my friends, um, they drink, like my car 
my friends at school. And um, uh, she, like, we have a group chat, and she messaged, like, she she was vomiting after, and... Um, she was? Vomiting Vom after, like, having, like, a half a bottle of vodka. And, uh, like, she felt so sick, and then, like, she said, I'm never going to drink again. And then, like, the next day, she's like, yeah, I'll drink. <laughs> um, yeah. I guess yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, the hangover is very bad, but somehow our memory, after we do it, the mind is so tricky that it remembers the pleasure and forgets the trouble. And you know, there is one kind of drug, again I forget the name, somebody who is like an alcoholic and they want to get, up, get rid of alcohol. One way they do it is that if you take that drug or you take that, it's a, I don't know, it will be a stretch to call it a medication. But if you take that and after that you take alcohol, it will cause you immediate pain. And that way, what happens is you know that the pain is immediate, then I won't take that alcohol. But people take that medicine, take that drug, take that particular pill or something, and even after that they take alcohol. So it's like although they get pain immediately, but still they can't give it up. So sometimes when you see that, it's not just okay, I'm desiring it, but the it's what do you say? Sometimes people you somebody was doing one thing. I say, you may, if you ask that person, oh, you said you're not going to drink. I say, I changed my mind. Yeah, well, did you really, ch did you change your mind or did your mind change you? <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> so it's, uh, the mind can control us sometimes. Thank you, Lakshmi. Yeah. You wanted to say something? Me? Yes, one of you, um, both of you had an answer. Yeah. Um, what is your name? Pundrika. Pundrika, yeah. Yeah, I had a mate here. Much slowly got into gambling, and then yeah, he ended up owing the bank or something. Yeah, he ended up with a date of like ten thousand, and he was like fourteen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ten thousand. Yeah, he was fourteen. They don't have any legal limits. Yeah, isn't it sixteen or eighteen? It's like mm. uh, it's kind of dark. It's kind of dark. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yes, I was in, what is that, uh, Sin City? Las Vegas. Las, Las, Vegas. Las Vegas, yeah. So it's interesting, in Las Vegas, the local people, it's Las Vegas, contrary to most ideas, it is one of the most low crime cities in America. How do they do that? Actually, they make sure that the crime stays low so that the gambling can go big. So they, they have these arrangements by which you can use your credit card and even without moving from your one chair, you know, you can, they will have computers coming in or people coming in, filling your forms and you might end up going there and you end up losing your house, losing your car, losing everything, not just your credit cards. It's like a, a every single penny that you have, it can be taken away from you. It's it's scary. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Pundrika. Devki. Devki. Okay, Devki, no, no, okay, yeah. So um, I had a mate. He was. <laughs> you had a what? A friend. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, he started smoking cigarettes, marijuana, mm. from a pretty young age. Mm. And so by the time he was about 15 or 16, he was already doing like cocaine, heroin, all the class A stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so then he got caught one time at school, he got kicked out of school, he got kicked out from home. Eventually he was living on the street, he had heroin addiction, and he was trying to kill himself multiple suicide attempts. Oh God, it's like a, that's horrible. I was in, I was in one city in America, which was that city? Connecticut, not Connecticut, something else. In that near New York only. It's, oh, thank you for sharing this. So he, I was there and there was one American, American man, and he had come with a very, with a girl. A small girl. So this American man seemed to be like maybe 65, 70. And the girl was just five. So I was wondering, 
what their relationship was. And then after my class, he came and talked with me. So he said that she's my granddaughter. And he said that my daughter started taking co cocaine. And she got into that heroin. And she's had one drug, another drug. I don't know the degrees, whichever it was. She went into deeper and deeper. And she said that at one, I, I was helping her as much as I could. But one day she came into my house and she broke into my safe and she, whatever, she went to bank or whatever, she took my life savings with her, $50,000 or something like that. And then, not only that, she left her daughter, I mean his granddaughter, alone at home. And then, somehow, maybe there's something which, uh, maybe there's a heater or something which had to be switched off and she forgot to switch it off. And a fire started in the house. And this girl, she was at that time just two and a half or something and she was left alone. And she started screaming when the fire came. Fortunately, the neighbors came and saved her. And then after that, he told me that when these two things happened, I said, I said enough is enough. So he said, I filed a police case against my daughter. And I uh, took the custody of my granddaughter for myself and she was sentenced and she had to go to a de-addiction center and even if she said now right now she is there and she even after she comes out she will not get the custody of her and of her daughter so he said that and when I did that my daughter was so angry with me she said, what kind of father are you doing and how can you do this to your own daughter how can you do this to a mother take away a child but that's what I had to do and she's, now she's there and now she's slowly recovering and she said this is the, the maybe she sometimes in a sober moment she feels this is a good thing. Maybe she will recover. So then I was talking with at this conference I came and I con later on I was at this conference and so they said that there's something called codependency. Codependency is where if somebody is an addict then maybe their spouse or their, their sibling or their parents or whoever they try to help them. But the way they help them is that this person has an episode and then their codependent comes and picks up all the pieces from the episode. And what happens by this is they unwittingly end up facilitating that person to do that thing. So sometimes when a person is addicted, the best thing we can do for them is to stop protecting them from the consequences of their actions. Sometimes only when the consequences hit them, that's when they they can be helped. So these are scary incidents, and it's so I don't want to have such a sobering note. But overall, let me speak a little. So this was the model: the body, the mind, and the soul. So now, how do I move from this? What is the solution to all this? So the mind is like a software. And once the software gets programmed in a particular way, that's how it functions. Say, if somebody has visited a particular website for a long time. Say, maybe sports.com. And they come to a spiritual program and then they, uh, they want to know, oh, what is spirituality? <coughs> they go to the browser and they type, start typing spirituality. SP. And what happens? Yeah, sports.com comes up automatically. That's because that was their, that was their preference. That was their, it's a short story saved as a default setting as a preference. So similarly for us, when we do a particular action, that gets stored as a preference within us. And once it gets stored as a preference, that's what comes back automatically. So you know, our mind is sometimes like a browser with maybe sometimes some people work on a computer and they have 25 tabs open and there are 25 tabs open and then three of them are frozen and from one of them a loud noise is coming <laughs> and which one is what you can't know so how do you shut it down so our mind becomes like that it has certain default settings and they trap us so those default settings are very difficult to to avoid so how, how can, so now as you said that we may not have any alarming addictions like that, but it can be device addiction, we can have a short temper, we can have, 
various kinds of negativities. So if I continue this metaphor, say if say I am here, the world is here, in between is the mind. So on this mind, various things keep coming up. So right now say, if you are sitting here, on you are watching me, so probably I am on your inner screen. But along with me, there are other windows open also. So maybe on a one window, there is something which is saying, how long is this class going to go on? Mm, I am hungry now. Is there a... <laughs> then, so like that, there are multiple tabs which are open. And what happens? Sometimes one tab just opens up. Say you are working on your computer and suddenly you get a notification. Your friend has updated their Facebook profile photo. And then, hey, what photo did they put? Let me look at it. You click, then it's small initially, you click it and then it occupies the whole screen. And you think, you think we'll watch for one minute and then you end up spending three hours. <laughs> <laughs> so similarly, now, now uh, what happens for us is, on our inner screen, one thought pops up and the thought starts growing. And as it keeps growing, 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 it completely overwhelms us. So basically, if you consider this inner screen, on this inner screen, if uh, basically there are two mental health problems which people have. One is depression and the other is anxiety. So in terms of this model, the mind is inside us, the world is outside us and we are further inside. If we take this model, how do we understand this depression or anxiety? Basically what happens? Whenever there is depression, this inner screen, which is the mind, it starts becoming like a TV screen. And on that, a movie starts. And what is that movie? Of all the bad things that have happened. This went wrong, that went wrong, that went wrong, that went wrong. And as you start watching that, it's terrible. You know, one of my friends is a counsellor, is a devotee counsellor. So you know when devotees meet each other, they say, please accept my... Humble obeisances. So this devotee told me I got a message from a devotee. Please accept my final obeisances. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, when I was at this conference on mental health and spirituality, the, I, one of my uh, one of my acquaintances there was he's become a friend now. He was a he's a suicide intervention counselor. So that means that if somebody is about to commit suicide, then they call. I'm going to commit suicide. So, and then he has to speak something to deter them from that suicidal course. So then, the, uh, he, he got a call, he said, I got a call from a girl who had already committed suicide. No, not that her ghost called, but rather, <laughs> rather she took the pills uh, to kill herself and they said, I don't want to die. <laughs> and then she called. So, in general, it's found that, you know, males are more given to physical violence than females. So what happens is, women attempt suicide more and men commit suicide more. So, so men are give, actually do physical violence more. Women more threaten physical violence. So anyway, that's a different set. We are not going to get into genders over here. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the point was that this is, this is, her case is an example of this. She attempted suicide. She said, no, no, I don't want to commit. So she called immediately, immediately. And then, fortunately there was an ambulance nearby. The ambulance reached in time. And then, he asked what happened. So then they saved her. And then he went to meet her and he asked what happened. And she said that, actually she was in a relationship with a boy. And this boy, she had called him. And he didn't pick up the phone. <laughs> he says, then, he said, that, that put me into depression. And then I come, then I do this. He says, what? Then I attempted suicide. He says, what happened? Then she said, okay, what, what were the thoughts coming in your mind? So, you know, somebody, somebody, how many of you have had, you call someone and they don't pick up the phone? <laughs> <laughs> never, happened. <laughs> never happened to you? <laughs> Is that because you don't call anyone? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? 
Yeah. So, millennials only text, text each other, huh? Yeah, that's it. We don't call anyone. But if they don't read the text. <laughs> yeah. Really? I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. One of my one boy told me that. No, emails have become old fashioned now. Yeah. Millennials don't use email. No. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> My father started using emails recently. <laughs> he said, now I have become modern, he said. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so then he asked her, what happened? What were the thoughts going on in your mind? So then she started telling. He said, what happened when I called this boy and didn't pick up the phone? So I started thinking, oh, maybe he doesn't care for me. Oh, maybe he's left me. Maybe he's with someone else already. Oh, maybe there's something wrong with me because of which he's left me. Even if I form some other relationship with someone, maybe they will also leave me. Oh, maybe whoever I form a relationship with, they, they will leave me. I'll always be alone. And all my friends will be in healthy, happy, long-term relationships. And I will be always alone. And they will all have pity on me. And my life will be so pitiable. What is the use of such a pitiable life? Let me end my life. So here you are seeing what happened was, see from that one stimulus of one answered phone call, a whole movie started inside. And that movie was like a horror movie. And as she was watching the movie, this, 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 she ended up about to commit suicide. So for us, Managing this mind and understanding what movies it is showing is very important. So I'll talk about three broad things with which I'll conclude this talk. I won't go much further. That you know, how do you deal with the mind so that we can work in a healthy way? So have you heard of this word in word inclination? What does it mean? Yeah, incline. What does it mean? Up. You're more eager to do something. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's somebody is inclined to do something means they like to do it. In other words, inclination also has a physical meaning. Incline. Go up. Go up, yeah. You know, if the road is tilted upward like that, we say it's inclined. So say, uh, imagine if this floor is inclined in this way. Then what will happen? That if water falls over there, the water will automatically flow in this direction. Now, if say you have got some expensive electronic equipment here, don't want don't want water to flow, won't want the water to flow over here. Now you just say don't, water should not flow. Well, that water is not going to cooperate. The water is still going to flow. Now, similarly, for us, when we keep doing particular things, our mind becomes inclined in a particular way. And when the mind becomes inclined in a particular way, our thoughts naturally flow in that direction. So somebody who is an addicted, their mental floor has not just become gently inclined, it has become very dangerously inclined. So as soon as they have nothing to think about, immediately they start thinking about the addiction. So if, even if it's gently also inclined, so we can all understand where our mind is inclined by exploring what we think about when we have nothing to think about. When you have nothing to think about, the consciousness falls on you, the thoughts start going in a particular direction. Now, some of them might be going in just the direction of entertainment, be sports, movies. Sometimes they might go in a little more destructive direction. So, whatever it is. So, now, whichever direction they are going in, some of them are healthy, some of them may be unhealthy, some of them may be deadly. And if we find that our thoughts are going in the particular directions, we need to be able to check this. And if water is flowing in this direction, and if you don't want water to flow and harm the equipment over here, what would you do? Sorry? Remove the equipment. Okay, but the equipment is... <laughs> That's a good solution. <laughs> that is like... That is like saying, oh, you know, there is a... There is a mosquito in this house. 
so let's drop a bomb on the house <laughs> if you could do it it's good but it's complex what would be a simpler way level it out level it out very good thank you anything else make the other side yeah make the other side change the incline change the incline yes level that's the same thing i say level it out and incline is the same no, thing no level out is like straight okay change the incline okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that's the that's the basically that's the, but before that if that's going to take a long time what could you do you could make a barrier for like excellent thank you come back bye that's creative <laughs> that's creative <laughs> okay a barrier could be one thing another thing i think there are three things i'm going to talk about and all of you got two answers now if say the floor is wet what do you do with it yeah you push the you mop it or push the water in some other direction so basically you could do three things the water is flowing in a particular Res restriction redirection and reconstruction hmm? for the floor so similarly for each one of us we all can think about some things which which if we didn't do we would be much better off so restriction means whatever is the thing which distracts us which tempts us which which uh, diverts us try to have some distance between you and them try to create a barrier between you and them so this barrier it's quite helpful in terms of ensuring that immediate impulsiveness doesn't happen i spoke in google and in google they had done this experiment they found that a lot of people were becoming uh, obese and then google had to pay a lot of health insurance for that so they decided how, how do you deal with it so they found that all the deserts that were there in their cafeteria they had a expert who came there and he said that just put all those deserts in containers that are non transparent and just by that small thing they found almost 30 to 40% of the dessert consumption started decreasing and of course for google that meant that their health insurance went down so this is just simple example the technical term for this is called as propinquity propinquity means the effect of space of of time and effort on action it like say if this is your home and this is your college and on the way there's a restaurant and that have some nice food which you like to eat so now if that restaurant is you're passing by and if that restaurant is crowded restaurant is crowded and it will have to spend when about 1 hour waiting in the queue to get to that food then you would say maybe some other day but if that's empty you would say oh let's go and take it so what happens is if some something is very easily available we succumb to it very quickly but if something is not that easily available a little effort is required that doesn't mean it will free it from us it will become free from it but at our desire our our moods our desires our emotions they are of different kinds some of them are just passing they come for a little time stay and they go away sometimes they stay for a long time and they are very strong but those casual desires that come if you consider our our craving if somebody is alcoholic also it's not that they constantly craving alcohol it's like there is a urge and the urge has a surge and when the surge comes that's when it's difficult to resist it normal time otherwise it's okay so restriction ensures that while the surge is there the object is not very easily available and when the surge goes away and then even the object by the time they go there get the object the surge is already gone so restriction is one thing the second thing is redirection now if the water were slipping away water were sliding down and we use our hands to push the water away that is quite an effort but if you have a mop and you can push it or dry it much easier so similarly for our moods uh, we can have various moods we can go into depression we can get anger now when these moods come they are like so the point i'm making is for redirection you need an ap ap appropriate instrument to redirect the water 
So when another example which you could use for this is that when the desires or the emotions, the moods come upon us, they are like waves. Now, have any of you gone swimming? In an ocean? Oh, okay. So when the waves come, you know, the wave is coming, can you fight the wave? No. It is too strong to fight it. Whichever direction the wave is coming, if it's a very strong wave, you get swept in that direction. So similarly, inside us, when the waves come, we may say, I will not do this. But then, when the wave comes up, we just end up doing it. It's very difficult to fight. Like that, our waves come inside us. So now when a wave is coming, if we had some anchor, some heavy object, some anchor which you could hold on to, then it would be much easier to avoid getting swept away by the wave. Now holding on to the anchor also requires effort. But, but comparatively speaking, holding on to the anchor is much more effective or productive than trying to fight the wave. So each of you need to find out what is an anchor for you. So the waves will come upon every one of us. And when the waves come, we need our anchor. Now what can be an anchor? So it could actually, if it's a whiteboard, I would have drawn it, but you can, all of you are young, so you can probably visualize it. See what happens is life makes, if you could say this is one circle, which is discomfort. Hmm? And there, from their discomfort, we have a default response. And the default response often leads to some kind of destruction. So nobody usually starts with the intention of becoming an addict or doing something stupid. They don't start with that. But everything begins with discomfort. So discomfort can be of various kinds. Discomfort can be boredom. Discomfort can be exhaustion. Discomfort can be loneliness. Discomfort can be overwork. Discomfort can be stress. Discomfort can be worry. So life will make all of us uncomfortable at times. Now, whenever we become uncomfortable, we need to deal with that discomfort. Now, un to be uncomfortable, as the word says, is it's not comfortable. So we want to get free from it. And when we want to get free from it, we often gravitate towards the default response. So for some, pe some people, it might be just, just surf on the net. Some people, it might just spend time in social media. For some people, it might be just go to sleep. For some people, it might be just eat a lot. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, crying. <laughs> crying. <laughs> yeah. All of us can have diff different default responses. So now, what happens is, at one level, when the discomfort comes, it's, 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 you can't stay in that discomfort for very long. You need some relief. So, that discomfort is like the indicator that the big wave is coming now. And if we go towards the default response, then that's like the big wave has already come. And then we get pushed down. So if we could, the anchor means that when the discomfort comes, you find out something which you like to do and which is also good for you. If we consider the circle of things that are that are that you like to do, and the circle which is also uplifting, which is good, which is positive, find out an intersection. And if you have that, when the discomfort comes, you go in that direction. If you go in that direction, then you can avoid this destructive cycle. So, each of you, now, when we talk about Bhakti Yoga, it is, it is not just about doing some rituals. The one challenge, most of you are devotee children, all of you, yeah. almost all of you. All of you, okay. So see what happens is, one major difference I have seen, uh, that between, see we, where, when we were introduced to Bhakti, our introduction was primarily to the philosophy and then to the practices. So, okay, this makes sense, this makes sense, this makes sense, that's why I'm practicing it. 
but for those who are born in devotee families first you get the practices and then maybe sometime later you get the philosophy so i was at a i was at a conference interfaith conference on on religion and youth in washington dc so there one of one christian pastor was sharing they had done a survey among their youth about what is their perception of a of religion and of a priest so one of the you one of the boys he said a priest is someone who is constantly worried that someone somewhere is having some fun <laughs> a priest is someone who is constantly worried that someone somewhere is having some fun <coughs> what they they felt is that means all the thing that we want to enjoy you people tell us don't do it <laughs> so then naturally if that is the conception who will want to practice anything like that so for all all of you what has happened is you got the practices first and maybe and the practices can sometimes seem quite restrictive or don't eat this don't watch this don't do this it can seem quite alienating now that is one aspect of it but the more positive aspect of it is that our bhakti is meant to give us healthy anchors so whether it could be kirtan whether it could be uh something else maybe reading some books or whatever so you have to find out your anchor and in fact in the journey of self discovery in in terms of your own understanding yourself if you even if you can find out one anchor that works for you that can protect you enormously the life is going to put all of you into trouble sooner or later and if you can find an anchor then that will help you guard yourself so with that anchor that so i'm going i'm talking about three points i talked about restriction whatever is your weak point whatever is the urge try to keep a create a barrier second is redirection for redirection it like anchor the water is flowing in this direction you want to push it in another direction the waves are coming you want to hold on so an anchor is something which you like to do and which is also good for you hmm and then you hold on to that so you try to go toward that when you feel uncomfortable and if you have an anchor you can save yourself from a lot of trouble and the last was what you said reconstruction reconstruction is where you make the the floor is inclined in this way you make it this way so how many of you have, uh, have felt bored sometime not this time right now <laughs> <laughs> obviously i can see now you are i'm going to finish in a few minutes but but uh, you feel bored at times isn't it 100% yeah in fact there was a survey uh, which said that how in the especially in the first world how people what are people's mental states so 5% of the time they are happy 5% of the time they are unhappy and 90% they are bored <laughs> so boredom is quite a big problem now often we'll find from boredom we go down to a destructive direction so if you can find an anchor say maybe you like to uh, now you like to hear some spiritual music or maybe play some instrument now at the same time you could just uh, go and maybe you spend time on social media now, social media is not bad but if it's seen as a as a tool for connection it is good but when it is seen as a escape way from life's boredom then that creates a dependency and that dependency can be damaging so anyway if you can find an anchor for yourself you can that will be a very big empowerment for you and the last thing is reconstruction reconstruction means you incline the floor in this way so for all of you in many ways your floor has already been inclined this way you know when you are born in a devotee family uh there you may feel that you are deprived of many things and it is true that many things which seem pleasurable you can be deprived of but you are also protected from many things so many things already the impressions have been created and your floor is inclined in a particular way but the practice of bhakti even if the floor is inclined in this way if you keep practicing bhakti the floor can become inclined in the opposite way and that's the transformation that is the transformation by which you can empower yourself 
the bhakti is not just about following some rituals it's about empowering ourselves from within so that the destructive forces that are there within us we can counter them we can protect ourselves and we can counter them and when we counter them then we can surprise ourselves with how much good we can do how much positivity we can channel into our lives and we can channel through us into the outer world so that's the concluding thought i would give you that bhakti is about bringing out your positivity it is not just about following some rules and that is actually all all of you can think maybe right now now you have your whole life ahead of you you can do a lot of good in your life and discovering how much good you can do in your life that is life's ultimate adventure and the life's ultimate best adventure would be discovering how much bad our mind can make us do the software inside us if we don't control it the software corruption inside us if we don't control it if we make us do one two three it can make us do terrible things but if we learn to manage it if we can manage your inner world then each one of you can do amazing things and especially with your spiritual connection with krishna krishna can empower you to rise to far greater heights than what uh, you would yourself have been able to do so doing the best good that we can and discovering how much good we can do that is life's ultimate adventure so i'll summarize quickly i spoke on the topic of managing our inner software managing our inner world rather so i started by talking about how i noticed that there's something inside me which is which makes a mess of things and one life one day i didn't want to kill an ant another day i wanted to attack a human being so i realized on reading the bhagavad gita that there's something inside us which works against us and i experienced that also through the alcoholic parents who wanted to give up alcoholism but on getting an opportunity they relapsed and even their kids relapsed during my social service stints so the bhagavad gita gives us the model of the self body mind and soul which is like the hardware software and user and our software can get corrupted in many different ways and when it is corrupted it prompts us in distracting or destructive directions so addiction is like a corruption of the software which impels us in uh, to act in ways that damage us and we discussed a few examples of addiction and how addiction can be destructive uh, and then i talked about how to deal with this the three r's does anyone remember three r's the example of the inclination restriction redirection yes thank you so restriction i talked about how in google when they just covered the deserts then the desert consumption decreased uh, so restriction so whatever it is that we are vulnerable to create a barrier between us and them so our urges have surges and if we can just have a barrier then the surge will come and go and we won't succumb so immediately then redirection was what i talked elaborately that we need a, a we can't just push water back with our hands but if we have a mop then it's easier to push back so similarly when the waves come we can't fight the waves but if you have an anchor then that can uh, protect us from being swept away so our moods our desires our emotions they can sweep us away coming like waves inside us so each of us need to find an anchor an anchor is something which we like to do and something which is also good for us so bhakti is meant to provide us in our anchors sometimes the rules and regulations of bhakti can seem like very restrictive but that's only one aspect the essential aspect of bhakti is that it provides us anchors to protect ourselves from the inner destructive waves and ultimately regular bhakti practice can have a reconstruction of our inner world so all of us if we give into the mind we can do far more terrible things that than what we might imagine but if we learn to manage our mind and we learn to do the best that we can then krishna can empower us to do extraordinary things and discovering how much good we can do that is life's ultimate adventure thank you very much 
हरे कृष्णा Thank you so much for coming Thank you. giving us such a a lot 